before that, I want to thank you all for everything. It's I know it's been we're all busy. We all got a lot going on and uh, really appreciate the time you've all spent on this. And uh, I couldn't I can't be happier than how it's all turned out. So I really appreciate it. So. Thank you. All right, statement. The, t the Tennessee Department of Education is, is excited to work with you on this opportunity to discuss the state's formula for funding public education. Before we begin, the department would like to remind you of the following. Someone read. Conversations on this topic are not intended to reflect on the current BEP funding formula. The current BEP funding formula will remain in place until a new funding formula is recommended to and approved by the Tennessee General Assembly. The public is encouraged to submit comments in writing to ensure that all communications are thoroughly documented and can be reviewed and considered in the future. Public comment is encouraged to focus on developing a new funding formula rather than revising the current funding formula. Consider what should be funded in a new funding formula and at what level. Subcommittees will be responsible for reviewing public comment and making recommendations for what should be included in the new funding formula. While all committees, subcommittees, and members of the public should feel free to communicate openly, documents and records may be subject to public inspec uh, inspection pursuant to the Pu uh, Tennessee Public Records Act and may be publicly posted or otherwise made available. And I'll go ahead and read the last one. All recommendations that are submitted by committees and subcommittees will be reviewed and considered, but not all recommendations will ultimately be included in the proposed new funding formula. And because of all your all's hard work, uh, we have submitted those recommendations. Again, great job, everybody. So thank you for that. All right, let me let me do the roll call. Uh, Megan Barra Lee Fogarty. Yes, I'm here. Hey, Megan. Uh, Claudia Caballero. I believe she was signing in a bit later. She was finishing a lunch meeting. Well, we're having lunch meetings. She could have joined us. Uh, Jeannie's having, uh, anyway, Tara, Tara Lentz. We're, we're an hour later here in the central. <laughs> yeah, so, that's right. I mean, in Eastern. Yeah. So. Present. Okay. Megan Vigil. Megan is a teacher at Smyrna, I believe Smyrna High School or Middle School. It's hard for her to get off for one hour in the middle of a school day. So I, 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 I don't know her well, but I'm defending her lack of presence because she's teaching. She's doing the work we're talking about. <laughs> there you go. Uh, Mauricio Calvo. Dr. Laura Clark. Here. Rebecca Peterson. Luis Parodi. He's probably doing some banking thing. Dr. Jean Barker. I'm here. Okay, thank you for lunch, by the way. Uh, Senator Todd Gardenhire. Representative Harold Love. And Mike Edwards. Okay. Hey, Raul, this is Claudia Caballero. I just joined in. Okay. Hey, Claudia. Hi. All right. Again, thank you all again for the hard work we've all put into this. We are finally crossing the finish line, and uh, this will be our last meeting. Hopefully, we will all see each other in the trenches, but meanwhile, uh, this will be our last Zoom meeting. So uh, basically, we're going to uh, get feedback on policies today. And uh, Penny will uh, post the, the policies. Uh, uh, the steering committee wants us to provide any feedback we have on, on these policies. So they, they've asked us to do this. And Penny will scroll down the policies until we've seen them all. 
And at, after that, if you have any feedback to any particular policy, uh, please comment and she will include that for the steering committee. OK, so she'll scroll them down. We can all read them uh, and then uh, once we've gone through them all, anything that you want to add or whatever we will cover. OK. We're not going to read them out loud. You're just going to read them so. I'm sorry, I might have missed something. I wasn't here last time we met, but the policy of economic um, disadvantage, the first one, the direct certification, is that referencing um, like application for state funding or? Uh, I, think, I think what we found last time is that that is when a student is already under covered, for example, under SNAP programs uh -huh. um, under needy families they're already enrolled or in atlas things like that where they are already identified and certified locally with the district so they sort of fall under that umbrella so do you know if that includes um free and reduced lunch as well because we have a lot I of families. okay we yeah I believe that's one of those. that don't qualify for other benefits but do qualify under that they will qualify for free lunch. Sometimes the um, reduced portion is more difficult to identify under that particular direct cert. <clears throat> I just know we had local schools that lost a lot of funding when it went to a direct certification for because schools were receiving um, based on the amount of students that were already receiving state assistance because a lot of our families that are EL families don't apply for state assistance you are um, correct and that that has been an issue <clears throat> so i don't yep. know if that needs to be noted in some way that for el families in particular the definition of economically disadvantaged to my understanding one of the best indicators has been the application for a free uh, or reduced lunch has been a lot more accessible way of defining that And, okay. the, and the records that the school holds as well, that the district holds. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that that's why that's a good, I agree with you, that's a good one because, you know, the district actually takes care of that process. Okay, great, great comments. Want to scroll down the, well, you're probably taking notes still. question about the teacher salaries. Um, the program 10 all core, uh, the 10 all, that one that's that is focused on um, tutoring, I believe grades fourth and up based on uh, those who are close to the threshold, but not necessarily with the lower level of special needs, but they're sort of a mid-level are <clears throat> I know that some some districts according to what I read in the materials you gave us Penny some districts are doing those services after school and some districts are doing those services during the school day when teachers are those tutors it says they're getting paid if the teachers are the tutors so teacher salaries we have frameworks for teacher salaries that give stipends, that give extended school year pay, that give uh, charts. Jean, Jean Barker, is mm -hmm. it or Jean? It's Jeannie. Jeannie. Mm -hmm. You know them probably by, you probably have memorized them, but my mm -hmm. point is, mm -hmm. could we incorporate some other type of extended or additional pay for ESL teachers who did tutoring after school, or maybe not just for ESL, but for any teachers, but that would certainly cover the ESL. 
Well, I think any district who asks teachers to go beyond the school day is responsible for making sure that they are compensated appropriately. And for some of the school districts that are using um, tutoring during the day, which we are, we are uh, employing retired teachers and, and other personnel in order to accomplish that. Now we are looking at utilizing some of our current teachers, but if it is an additional assignment, then we will stop in them for that. Now, whether or not it's ELL or uh, regular ed. So um, and, and that, that falls under differentiated pay, not really a teacher's salary schedule. It's really more differentiated pay. And that's a local decision, not a state decision. Uh, and locally right. funded and not state funded? No, it is state funded, yes. It, it's for, okay. Right now for the next two years, the legislature has, has uh, given us this opportunity to implement TNL Corps. Um, the, our hope is that we will have such wonderful results that we can take that to the legislature and say, we need this to be a recurring item for funding. But right now it's for the next two years. Okay. I believe in the draft, um, and Dr. Barker, you may um, know this already. Some of you may have, some of you others may have the draft pulled up, but I believe um, high ratio, low, um, high dosage, low ratio tutoring was one of the recommendations from a lot of the committees, subcommittees in the additional dollars section yes. of the draft. I saw that in the draft. Yes, you are mm -hmm. correct. Okay. Yeah. Is this implying that we haven't put forth any suggestions on policy for teacher salaries? So did we submit anything around um, sort of, I don't know if, if teachers with an EL credential are further compensated or receive bonuses of any sort? Is that something that we can recommend to encourage there to be more qualified EL teachers in the state? I, I think on our must-haves, should-haves, and all that, we covered that. I believe that, so. I'm just that, looking at this right here and not understanding the question part. Am I correct to assume that, Penny, all the subcommittees received the same policy questions? Yes, everybody. This is not specific okay. to EL. Exactly. This is, so let, let me give you a little bit of background. The commissioner met with the steering committee last week, and I shared that video and that PowerPoint with all of you. And this, the steering committee, um, you know, talked about, gave their thoughts on the policies, but then they also wanted to uh, bring it to the subcommittees to see what your thoughts would be, because they thought maybe you have some better ideas. And it could be related, you know, you all can say specifically around teacher salaries, for EL students or EL teachers or um, in the tutoring, you know, it, it could be based on some of your recommendations, but it would be um, it would go in the policy or, or, or just be a consideration. And it's not a, a list of this committee has to have a formal recommendation. This is really a brainstorming session to get your thoughts for that steering committee to con just to consider and think about. I would like for them to consider two groups of educators for salary consideration, uh, additional salary stipend or something. And those two groups, uh, those two groups share something. And it is, they work with children with a hugely diverse range of abilities, even more so than what I would consider a typical classroom teacher. And those two groups of teachers are special education teachers and teachers of English learners. And because uh, just the, the wide, variety of children and needs and levels that those two groups deal with. I'm sure I'm leaving out some group, Dr. Barker, but those two groups, and they also share another thing. They are measured in testing and they're disaggregated in test results. And I think that might be something to justify looking at a different kind of funding, maybe. I would, I, I certainly appreciate all of the work that they do, but here would be the concern I have that okay. all of our teachers yeah. have a unique opportunity with the group of students that they serve. Yes. The groups that you mentioned, yes, have a wide range, 
the other teachers in our core academic areas have high stakes testing and they have high numbers. Yes. So uh, the challenges are large in, in both. So to differentiate one over the other, I, I think does something to the spirit of, of teachers. Um, yes. That would, that, that would be my caution. Uh, and, and I am with you on that as well. That, that, uh, that is my concern in, in, uh, in general in merit pay programs and any kind of differentiated pay it, it, that, you know, that there is, there is a chance of it impacting work, uh, faculty morale. So, so, um, uh, yes. Look, I I, this is, this is, this is Todd Gardner. Let me weigh in just a little bit on that. We're only looking at English learner, English language learner teachers. And I know it's nice to promote the extra pay for all the other teachers that do it, but let's let's stay focused. Let let the other groups prioritize their things, and let's stay with these teachers that are teaching English learner, English language learners. That's just my comment. Well, um, I, I agree with that, but we've been uh, assigned to uh, outside on this particular project anything, not just EL related. If the steering committee has requested every committee to comment in general of all education, not just what we're covering in this committee, unlike what we've done in previous meetings where we focused on EL, this particular task is on everything. Correct, Penny? Okay. Yes, that's right. Come off mute. And these are just thought again, these are thoughts at brainstorming, um, not necessarily formal recommendations from the English Learners Subcommittee. These are just um, thoughts for the steering committee to consider as they are they are writing these policies or, or recommending these policies. OK, so, so I'll keep scrolling down. Yes, please. On the on the tutoring mm -hmm. one, the next one, I think before we fund a legally required support, we should see how it goes because it's uh, it's just getting started. Is that correct? Yes, I think we should see how it goes and see what works before we would recommend that it be um, and you know, and in, in policy and statute, that's what I would say. Because funding funding's already designated for this tutoring program, correct? TN All Core, it's already designated for two years, I believe. Yes. Two years. Dr. Barker's two years long enough to no, know if it's working. Oh, I, I can tell you it's working now. Um, it's it's one of the most effective strategies that I think um, we have looked at as a state. Now, you know, we've done a lot of things locally, but as a state, I think it's a it's a good opportunity. Kids. I was in a district this morning, um, and they uh, it was a, a pre K two building, and their kindergarten first and second grade from their baseline in September when they started Labor Day have doubled, um, doubled their in, increased. Now they started low, um, they, they started really low, but they've doubled from first nine weeks to the uh, beginning of the third nine weeks. So that's pretty incredible. And and in this, in, in the TNL core, um, are ELs served in this as well? They can be, yes. There's nothing that that eliminates them from from participating in that. And we are keeping data, so we will have uh, good information. We've just had our, our mid year touch, just like Penny was talking about, and yes. so we will have data. We're tracking it. Then I would tie the legally required support uh, with you know with supporting uh, to say if we if the data shows that it's working, then yes. 
That's my thoughts on it. OK. Anything else on this section right here? Dr. Clark, I'm looking at you with and remembering the WIDA outcomes that we made sure to include. Would you see those as appropriate outcomes like for the middle school or elementary school outcomes that it mentions? WIDA for, for elementary and middle, yes. High school is a different animal. Mm -hmm. And uh, particularly the ELs that come in at an older age and they are thrust into a group of um, t kids who are their age, but typically are many ELs come in with many more life experiences at the age of 16 and 17, and they really have difficulty dealing and, and living in the world of American high schools. <laughs> I've, I mean, I've heard that a, a number of times from people who work with them. And that's why, I have a note here on one of these. I made some policy notes here to um, look at re-examining in whether it's in CTE or whether it's in the older ELs to re-examine the uh, pace of instruction and ex expediting instruction to not so much to meet ten ready or the. Uh, to meet life skills and life goals and to be taught in the context of real world life. And I'm talking in the older. And that that may be an entirely different discussion, but it does it does reference in the in the state ESL policy. It references older students. And uh, you asked the question about WIDA. I think WIDA for sure on middle and, and elementary. Dr. Barker, what do you think? WIDA in high school, what do you think? Well, WIDA doesn't necessarily correlate with T and ready. Uh, you know, it assesses the language um, performance levels. And, and you are right. When a student comes in at um, 14, 15, 16, uh, 17 and they've not been in school since the third or fourth grade yes from another country and they're already working yes they do not have the uh, skills nor the motivation to accomplish what we expect them to do and that is to graduate from high school because if they don't graduate from high school then we all um, are put at a disadvantage and so I don't know what the answer to that is when they come in from another country um, and they don't have any language skills. They're, neither do their parents. They don't have any help. And then they're going to work to help support them. So um, I honestly don't know a fix for that uh, because no. everyone is different. If there are a way, were a way when, when older English learners come into high school to have sort of a triage moment where you determine what does this kid want? What do their families want? Do we triage them into CTE and uh, GED perhaps? Not that the two go together because they don't. Or do we triage them because they want and their parents want them to get on an academic track and go to college? And so, you know, if there were a way with these older kids to ask that question when they came in, in the, in the screening process, because that way they would have um, a voice in it and hopefully be put on a more authentic pathway for themselves. And it could be expedited even. You know, there's andragogy, which is the teaching of adults. And, and the way you teach adults is different than how you teach kids, which is pedagogy. This doesn't relate to funding exactly, so I'll make this comment quick, but here in Nashville, our organization has a full-time staff member at one of the high schools that has a large number of new arrival students, but like you're describing, and her job is to basically meet them at the door on the front day, help them understand everything from how do I walk through the lunch line to sitting in class with them and translating sometimes if needed to 
thinking through college and career readiness. And so I don't know if there are any options like scrolling down this document around the things we've talked about as a committee relating to college and career readiness, wraparound supports, but that might be an approach. The school here funds it through their own discretionary funding. You know, the state, uh, the state certainly focuses on college and career readiness. I know in ca through counseling programs and, and in CTE, college and career readiness. And I think for English learners, college and career readiness has that extra element that you just described, Tara, that it has to do with uh, what the life experience they may already bring to the table. And so I think that what you just described, Tara, sounds really beautiful. And I'm sure that's helped a lot of kids feel um, more motivated. So is that a like a policy thing or? Uh, that... Kenny, if we scroll down, is there anything related that where that would fall under one of the questions? Um, Well, and this, I, is certain, this is certainly not all of them. These were just some that the steering committee would, you know, wanted extra, um, extra thoughts around. So Tara or whoever asked that question, I know, I know where it is in the state ESL policy. I've got it right here. Okay. And we could write in the policy number, uh, which is 3.207.5.C. <laughs> which is which references uh, the uh, high school English learners. Perfect. So, OK, I'm going to need you to tell me exactly what that what your thoughts were about that, about high school outcomes. Um, I would others jump in, but I would say like um, wraparound services geared toward new arrival high school high school English learner students and and add college and career readiness into that because that's a term that relates to a lot of policy and practice mm -hmm. and a college and career readiness uh, a screening for that unique to or uh, or um, uh, responsive to or uh -huh to older uh, to high school English learners geared toward. And what, what is that policy number, Dr. Clark? Three point two zero seven point five point C. C. OK. Very good. And, and the wording that I used is that high school ELs uh, to somehow receive age appropriate and expedited instruction. But Tara, you said it well. So Senator Gardenhire, I guess we're uh, doing what you asked. It's going well. <laughs> well, great. <laughs> yeah. Amen. <laughs> All right. Anything? Uh, should we go down or? Let's see. Professional development opportunities. Um, I think it's the last. It's the last printed. Yeah, right there. Y'all, we talked about this. In fact, we ranked this in those list of things we looked at. And professional development opportunities in terms of um, training whole whole staffs of of teachers and support staff in in issues that are relevant to English learners. And I, the term. I think we started using was cultural competence. So maybe we should say see our previous recommendations. 
Well, then they have to go back and find our previous. Could we just write it in there? <laughs> sure. And say, uh, uh, professional development opportunities for uh, all educators in Tennessee to increase cultural competence as applied to English learners, something like that. Related to English learners. I got it. And, and um, in, in the recommendations we've made, I just, I have a few others. We don't have to look at them all, but I went, I went through the ESL state policy. I just read it and I found where it, re the current policy referenced the kinds of things we've been talking about. And in some cases, the policy, the, the actual stated policy says what we're seeking. <laughs> but we all know that there's policy and then there's practice. And sometimes they match and sometimes they don't. So I, I've just identified a few, Penny, that um, kind of link to what the committee has already expressed a concern about. One is the screening. Um, and I, uh, which is uh, 3.207.2.B, like boy. And there it, it talks about screening for ELs. And there's, I would love to put in that in that screening process, not only are we looking at identifying language fluency, but we're also trying to identify if we should refer for further screening for special needs. And I think in that screening process, um, there, there can be some items, some questions that could be included in that screening process that would cause one to refer a child for further testing for learning disabilities or for dyslexia or for um, special needs. So that's that's that one. And then um, 3.207.6 talks about staffing and ratios. And, and we've talked about that in this committee. The phrase that's used is staffing adequately. That's a ballpark figure there, staffing adequately. And so, Jeannie, I'm sure that adequately means meeting whatever are the required ratios. Is that right? That <clears throat> yes, you are correct. And that has been my concern all along. I keep I keep bringing that up is that the ratios are not adequate based on student performance levels. But yes, I do believe that's what that means. So they're asking us for policy suggestions, Jeannie. What do you think? <laughs> well, uh, I believe that the policy mm -hmm. is, should reflect um, adequate instructional ratios for performance levels. And that is fewer students for the, the um, newer language learners. Uh, and, and you can use WIDA. You can use the WIDA uh, test results to document so, um, so what those should be. I just heard you in, in, add the phrase according to performance levels. Here's what the here's what the current policy says. Adequately staff ESL programs to meet state and federal requirements. Mm -hmm. yep. This includes but is not limited to having sufficient staff to ensure meaningful communication with parents 
to identify ELs and to monitor transitional ELs. So it does not, that policy language does not talk about performance. No, it doesn't. And our uh, state BEP formula call, doesn't talk about it either. All it does is have a ratio, one to 35 ratio. Yeah. Which is higher than any other ratio we have. <clears throat> so is this the point for us to recommend that this a staffing policy for adequate staffing also be mm -hmm. tied to performance? I would say so, yes. And you could, uh, you know, the uh, beginners, beginner level would be, I think at a minimum one to eight or maximum, I guess, a one, to, one to eight ratio. And if we wanted to uh, break it down by performance level and have a recommendation for ratio or simply say that it, it needs to, uh, be a ratio that will adequately provide instructional opportunities for those students in the performance levels. Well, you know, in the policy language, though, couldn't we just give the general term based on performance levels, and then when they write the regs, that's when they can put in the ratios? Sure. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's good. Okay. Anything else? Um, there, okay, I'm just, yeah, I'm gonna say this. There's one more, just one more for me, and it's in the ESL current policy. There's another reference in there to uh, where they say ELs with special needs, and this is, a penny, it's 3.207.5 point F like funny. And it says, LEA shall ensure that all ELs who may have a disability are located, identified, and evaluated for special education and related services in a timely manner in accordance with the with IDEA section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 and Tennessee Code Annotated 4910-101. When conducting special education evaluations, LEAs must consider the English language proficiency of ELs in determining the appropriate assessments and other evaluation materials to be used. And they shall not be identified as students with disabilities solely because of their limited English language proficiency. They uh, must pr provide ELs with disabilities with both the language assistance and disability related services. So that's the section that addresses ELs with special needs. And I mean, it says what we have talked about, but I don't know if it says it well enough. It does say here that RTI, Jeannie, is, you already know this, RTI is not counted as special ed services. Right. And Dr. Clark, you did mention, uh, and you have mentioned it several times, that it's not so much the, the, uh, what's written in a process, it's the instruments that are not available to do what we need to do through that process. So we're using the instruments that we have, but they're inadequate because they're not in the language of the student in many times, or we're using some kind of translation services um, that can be difficult to adequately um, make the interpretation that students need in order to do well, or to show what they know on those tests. Right. So it, I think that's, I think we all know what we need to do, but having the tools to accomplish yes. that yes. is where we're lacking. So I, I think maybe this language probably covers it here, doesn't yeah. it? I, I would think so. I still think we're lacking on the assessment tools. Um, so there's screening tools and there's assessment tools, which is diagnostic and there's formative and summative. So we're talking assessment tools. I'll tell you this uh, for all of you, but Dr. Barker, you particularly. In our last <coughs> presentation in our collaborative, one of our professors here is work is studying a tool that 
allows ELs to be assessed um, using their home language, but it is, let, let me pull that phrase back. It is a different kind of assessment tool. She and another professor are looking at it and studying it, and we're bringing it to the EL Collaborative, and I'll also bring it to Deborah France as well. But still, we're looking at some tools that might be better in that screening process, but you're talking about the assessment. I don't have an answer for that one. Unless the state funds research to find it. Did we put that in the must haves and all that? I think there are tools out there somewhere, maybe it's California, Texas, or Florida, that with all due respect to Texas, that is if they'll let us sh share, if they'll share their secrets with us, but <laughs> no. Um, I think it's bound to be tools that out there. Okay. We have millions of English learners. So, 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 so the state to that. I'm sorry. So would that be a policy that we put in there that they find the tools? Uh, uh, I mean, I'm I'm not. My my big thing is not policy, so I don't know how how that would be a, a policy thing. So uh, would it be a policy to have proper research from other states on an ongoing basis or well, something? Well, we could uh, we could. I think you can work into policy language that it is evidence-based and research, research-based and research and evidence-based, but uh -huh. um, um, which I know all the tools we use right now are, are that. In the policy level of it, I think if we referenced uh, at conti continually se seeking or uh, continually continually seeking to improve the screening and assessment tools using um, research and evidence based data, not data, research and uh, using research. I have to sign off and go to a committee meeting. I'll catch y'all later. Thank you. It's been informative. Thank you, Senator. Senator Appreciate it. I need to jump off for a meeting as well as well and, as and Claudia. That's, that's all. I'm, I'm going to be quiet now because that's all I had written down here. Anybody have any other comments or any policy changes, ads, or comments? How about your dog behind you, Michelle? Does, uh... He's enjoying the sunshine. <laughs> OK, well, I think we've done it. A lot more than I thought we would have done. This is really good, ladies. Uh, so uh, really appreciated that. And uh, Penny, you'll forward that and. Um, Again, I really appreciate what everybody's done. Let's stay connected. Uh, you know, if if uh, we can help each other out in the cause, because we all know we we want to help this uh, our the community that we focus on. So, which helps the entire state of Tennessee. So, Raul, thank you for your leadership and for keeping us uh, like herding cats, keeping us on point. Well, <laughs> I appreciate that, but I mean. You all have so much knowledge and, ex and experience. Uh, it has nothing to do with age, it's just experience. So uh, I'm very appreciative of, yes. I've, I've learned a lot, so thank you very much. So, all right, well, God bless you all. Have a great week, and I look forward uh, to see how this evolves. So see you all later, and again, right. thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank Thanks, you. Everyone. Take care. Bye. Bye.